All right, let's get started on this webinar of capacitance analysis of ultrasonic transducers. Uh, my name is Hussein Shikani uh, from Ultrasonic Advisors, and we will go to the next slide now, uh, which gives a basic overview of this presentation. Uh, I'll be talking about what capacitance is. Um, it's always nice to refresh that information uh, and uh, how it relates to ultrasonic transducers. It's not a parameter which is valued very much. It's either not measured or measured and not considered. It's definitely, it's, 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 uh, it's hard, it's, it's rare that um, we value it. And uh, I'll kind of teach you why it's important and what it can really teach you when you're, especially when you're in very unique situations. So I'll also describe some expert tips to measure capacitance and what do you do with them? What do you do with those measurements at the end of the day? Um, and one of the beautiful things about capacitance is that it's a very simple measurement. It's relatively simple to interpret. Um, it doesn't give you as much information as resonance measurements, like resonance impedance, resonant frequency, and so on. That gives you, but it's more direct and straightforward. So that's where the value actually uh, comes in. Um, and it's another measurement to do, which is sort of independent of those measurements. So why not go ahead? Um, so uh, just a quickly about my company, I founded in 2019. Uh, I have expertise in working in many different ultrasonic transducers, uh, sensors, atomizers, surgical transducers, motors, um, uh, other types of uh, uh, ultrasonic uh, fluidic devices. Um, I do provide services to a lot of companies working on both clamp Langevin transducers. So uh, perhaps you can say there's a specialization there, but still pretty general. Um, usually in devices working under five megahertz all the way kind of down to the DC uh, operation level. Um, I provide support in simulations as well as many other different aspects uh, of, the, uh, of the whole ultrasonic transducer development. A lot of times my, my clients are the ones who are kind of doing the hands-on work and I'm providing um, uh, advisory and also uh, some measurements and simulations. So the best way to get in touch if you do have a consulting uh, kind of a need is either a call, you can email, or you'll be on my email list for other, um, uh, for other communications that I send out. And now here's kind of the more detailed outline. Um, I'll get to all these points in various amounts, uh, but, and there's actually a lot of things I haven't put on here, and I'll probably try to skip over and move quickly, uh, because I really want to help you understand what to do with these measurements, how to make them correctly, which isn't extremely hard to make them correctly. It doesn't take a lot of specialized equipment, but it, but you need to at least consider it before, you know, what often happens in ultrasonic transducers is that, you know, engineers take a lot of measurements, they don't make any sense, and therefore, they don't, they don't believe or they, they can't use them at all because there wasn't proper attention given to how to make them. Uh, so capacitance is different than the resident measurements. It's usually easier. Uh, so I'll describe that. Uh, so let's talk about what capacitance, what capacitance is, how is it measured, what's the significance or what's the origin of capacitance and how that relates to ultrasonic transducers and how does an expert measure capacitance? Um, uh, so you can do that. And how would an expert use capacitance measurements? Um, there are many places that they can be used and analyzed. Um, the list is here, and I'll go through that uh, in this presentation. So first, all right. I'm actually going to, all right. So let's go here. So let's talk about what, you know, what is capacitance? Um, so capacitance is, you know, if you just take a material, let's take a, all right. Computer's going a little bit slow. I'm probably gonna have to exit out of this. All right, so this should help things along. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is a block of material and we know like materials either, you know, they have, every material has some type of electrical property to it. You know, either they have like a conductive property. So they're like a resistor, uh, that's probably the wrong, you should just use R, or they are capacitive. Like even a piece of wood has a capacitance to it. And, you know, there are ions internally that displace when you provide a voltage. Uh, but there's no net displacement, so a piece of wood isn't really piezoelectric in any useful capacity. Um, so if you apply voltages over the material and make sure you have polar, you know, make sure you have metallization across of it. Um, so because 
well, that's how you get the electric fields to go across the material instead of just kind of clump in one spot. So to have more an ideal setup. So you provide a voltage and you get a charge. So the, the, the equation is the charge equals the capacitance times the voltage. Um, and if you look in the time domain, so this is kind of a static view or instantaneous view. If you look in the time domain, we're actually providing a sinusoidal voltage you know, of some like amplitude. Uh, in that case, you'll actually, if you take the derivative of charge, so you know, the derivative of charge is actually current because coulombs per second. So the derivative of charge is current. So that's I for current. So the current amplitude is actually equal to the uh, derivative of volt, you know, the capacitance times the derivative of voltage because this is sinusoidal, you'll get that omega coming out and you'll have voltage here. So with higher frequency, there's more current from the same capacitance. At low, at low frequencies, um, there's a very, very low current. It's almost like an open circuit condition. At very high frequencies, it's almost like a short circuit condition where you have a huge amount of current going through uh, a capacitor. So piezoelectric materials, uh, in general, they are uh, dielectric. So they are, they are uh, capacitive type you know, materials. So we have also this factor of what loss, uh, but before I introduce that, I'll just talk a little bit more about the AC um, behavior. So if you apply a voltage, a sinusoidal voltage, um, uh, the current will lag 90 degrees. And I'll just go kind of quick here. Uh, and we also would consider, so um, basically no power is dissipated in a perfect capacitor at 90 degrees phase. Uh, but in a real capacitor, we don't have 90 degrees phase. We have, let's say, negative 89 or somewhere less than 90. And that's representative losses. And there's a bunch of physical derivations, linear equations that all talk, that all would tell you why the current shifts from 90, negative 90, when you have losses involved. Um, so in this case, I mean, negative, at negative 89, let's say that's the measured um, current, you know, the, the phase, you would have basically one degrees phase difference. You convert that into radians. And that is actually equal to your dielectric loss, uh, which is a ratio between, um, between loss and energy, energy lost versus energy stored kind of in a cycle. Um, or you can also convert this then into, into AC into power. So it's a non it's a, sorry, it's a non-dimensional. I was going to say non-denominational. It's a non-dimensional property similar to the quality factor, uh, the mechanical quality factor, as many of you may be aware of. That's also a non-dimensional property. So there's this there's this AC aspect of of losses occurring um, because energy is stored in a capacitor, and as you as you reduce voltage, you know energy there's zero energy here. As you have the highest voltage, you have the maximum storage. And then you reduce voltage, and now you have no charge, basically. So you have no stored uh, energy on that capacitor. So we can, you can also describe impedance. So for the AC, AC response. Um, so if you guys probably do remember, a impedance is basically voltage divided by the current amplitudes. And I'm, I'm just being really general. I'm not really putting too many subscripts or absolute values and stuff. Uh, but from this, you could, we can derive pretty very easily that the capacitance, that the impedance is equal to the um, uh, reciprocal of the uh, angular frequency multiplied by the capacitance itself. Um, and this can actually be used to measure this is one way to use to measure the capacitance in AC conditions. So it's easier, it's pretty easy to measure capacitance if you do have an AC voltage applied. So that kind of leads, leads us to uh, the few ways we can measure. Uh, so again, if you measure current and you measure voltage, you can calculate impedance. And from impedance, you can use the, the frequency that you're using then to calculate the capacitance. You can also calculate capacitance in a DC case with a time constant. You may be familiar with time constant, like an RC time constant, um, but that has other significant drawbacks, and that's and there, it, it 
is not a way that is commonly used for many good reasons, and I'll explain that. Um, so the different ways we use to measure um, capacitance, there's the LCR meter, which is like very, it's, which is very just, you know, you plug in, you plug in the device, you you hook it up, you you know, you just press the button, and it gives spits out a capacitance, and as you are aware, perhaps already, capacitance is measured in farads. Most ultrasonic transducers are going to be uh, in the, like a nanofarad, let's say between one and probably 30 nanofarads. That's, that's around the range of what we, what we find for ultrasonic uh, transducers. Uh, the other way is an impedance analyzer. And as you uh, would imagine, you get the, the, the impedance here, and you also get a phase value. Uh, and that's how you would calculate a loss factor. And from the impedance, you would calculate a capacitance value um, from the equations I described. And, I, I, and this is another way. Um, if you don't have any meter or any analyzer equipment, well, you can use an oscilloscope, a voltage probe, and a current probe then to measure the impedance and then also get to the capacitance. Now, to measure phase like this is a problem. Phase is not accurately measured on an oscilloscope with a voltage probe and current probe, because sometimes you have phases like negative, you know, 89.7 or 89.9. So those are really high phase values. The jitter and the accuracy of using a voltage probe and current probe are just not going to cut it for measuring dielectric uh, loss. Um, but for very high dielectric loss values, it's it's possible to use. Uh, those, you know, use the setup, but for ultrasonic transducers, which typically have high power requirements and thus have low loss values for the ceramics and the materials used, you will not likely be able to measure uh, with much accuracy at all um, the phase uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, a, in its capacitive state, basically a lower, a lower frequency like one kilohertz or 10 kilohertz, let's say for a 40 kilohertz um, transducer. All right, so I think I covered everything here. Um, so yeah, let's go back to the, to the main kind of list and talk about how an expert measures capacitance. Um, so there's a couple of factors here to consider. Uh, the first factor is frequency. So let's talk a little bit about frequency um, when measuring capacitance. But before, before we do that, um, let's let's look at this. Uh, you know, uh, let's let's look at the these impedance responses and just get get an appreciation for what we're actually measuring or what fr frequency range we're measuring at. Um, so on this side we have a buzzer, uh, and on this side we have a forty. And let's do this correctly. The computer's a little bit slow right now because I got a couple things plugged in. Uh, and recording the presentation. Uh, but then this is a 40 kilohertz like ultra cleaning transducer. So the buzzer, as we can see, this is frequency. This is four kilohertz is its first resonance. Well, that is not an ultrasonic transducer. That's a sonic transducer, you could say, because the resonance frequency is low because it has it's a structure which has it's very compliant. Um, and I would I had a video on kind of feed on the other side, but it was taking too long. So if you may, may see this structure, we're probably pretty familiar with a unimorph configuration. Um, so it's pretty compliant. It has a low resonant frequency. Um, so below that resonant frequency is the capacitive region where we have a the piezo acting in a pure capacitive state, not affected by resonances. Um, and for the 40 kilohertz transducer, obviously the frequency is higher. We have that capacitive region extending for a lot longer uh, period. Uh, so when looking at what frequency to measure capacitance at, uh, we want to measure at approximately uh, at least lower, at least four or five times lower than the resonant frequency itself. Um, and the reason that we want to measure at, um, you know, we don't want to measure at a very low frequency, but we don't want to measure at a very high frequency. So the very high frequency is going to be resonance. So let's uh, write some notes. Let's talk about frequency. So this is going into how do you measure capacitance? What frequency do you choose and why? Like, why do we do one kilohertz? Like, what's the, what's the, what's the purpose? Uh, so, um, so I mentioned not too low. It's not coming out as neatly as I hope. Not too low. 
or high. And high is with regards to the resonant frequency. So you could say the resonant frequency divided by five. About that's kind of where you wanna where 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 an ideal value would be. Um, so this is so you don't, I think it's kind of obvious, so you don't run into the resonance properties, but also you don't want to measure it, let's say at one, you know, at DC frequencies or generally at, let's say, 100 hertz, uh, because at low frequencies, there are additional, um, there are additional contributions to the capacitance, which are not relevant for higher frequency operations. So when you're going to be running at 40 kilohertz, you want to have you want to be measuring capacitance values that intrinsically do contribute. Now they're going to be a little bit more subtle, but there's still will, those properties or those mechanical uh, and uh, microscopic conditions that contribute toward the performance at 40 kilohertz. Um, they are different. Some of them are they're more they're sometimes additional. Uh, values that exist, uh, you know, additional mechanisms. So one of those is called space charge. So kind of free charges uh, and those add to the capacitance. So you may actually me end up measuring a higher capacitance and those space charge values also increase your loss value. So your capacitance will, uh, can be higher, your losses values can be higher, but those loss values and the inflated capacitance, inflated losses aren't really re as relevant to your higher frequency uh, uh, measurement. So capacitance, uh, and I'll and I'll explain. So right now we'll talk about the origin of capacitance. I knew I was forgetting something. Um, so the origin of capacitance uh, for piezo transducers. Uh, well, you guys are probably familiar with the symbol for a capacitor. Uh, but, and you know, the funny thing is that the capacitor also has an equivalent circuit. You could say that, that, that creates this. And, and, and you know, the reason we, we create equivalent circuits is to isolate mechanisms. That's why we have the Van Dyke circuit just to isolate certain areas so we can quantify them and uh, better understand our, our complete device. And, and you, you, all, you all also probably know typically the um, symbol for a transducer in a circuit is a crystal, um, which then it kind of represents, um, it represents a, you know, an LCR kind of deal here uh, with the Van Dyke circuit basically. But we're gonna be focusing on this one right here. So this is an equivalent circuit for a capacitor of, a, of an ultrasonic transducer. So as you can see, we se I separated those into two values. So what are these two contributors? One is going to be the dielectric contributions, the pure dielectric. This part of the capacitance is not related to mechanical motion because um, capacitance or the charge generated. So when you put a voltage on a piezo device or on a dielectric material, um, charges start to separate or any dielectric material, the charges move. That's why you end up getting a net displacement in charge. Uh, at least in the electro electrostatically, you get net displacement, so you get charges developing on the surfaces to then counteract the, the changes internally in the in the in the material. Um, so the one type of you know ion shifting is does not cause a net change in strain, mechanical strain. So this has no mechanical strain involved with that mechanism. However, this mechanism is mechanical strain because when the piezos when the when the ions do move in a piezo material, they also actually physically get larger. So they change in shape. Uh, that, that change in shape also separates the ions to a certain extent, which then gives rise to a, another generation of source of charge generation. So this right here, like for a piece of wood or a piece of dielectric material, this wouldn't exist. Also for a um, non-polarized piezo ceramic. So a non-polarized piezo ceramic does not exhibit uh, net, you know, net strain, does not exhibit strain or displacement when you put an electric field on it. Therefore, it doesn't have this other component. So you would expect a, a non-polarized piezo ceramic to have lower capacitance because it doesn't have that net displacement in charge. Uh, they have locally, but not net displacement in terms of physical, physically net displacement. So what? No, what, what, so we have two two components, uh, and they're related by the coupling factors. Uh, so the larger the coupling factor, the larger the ratio. So if you can come up with this, like 
capacitance mechanical divided by the capacitance total. Um, so the, the higher the coupling factor, the higher this ratio would be. And now this is a this is equivalent circuit that you can't press on your impedance analyzer because you know we're used to taking the taking this and you can click, you know, if you have an impedance analyzer and it gives you this thing and you click on this little button here and it'll generate your capacitance, your uh, resistor and all that stuff. There's no button you can press. This is kind of a this is more conceptual because it's kind of it doesn't have a distinct feature that you can separate these two properties. You're going to have to do something mechanical in order to get a little bit more understanding. Um, so let's take a look here. So we have, let's say, let's say we have two states of material. So we have the ceramic and we then, and then and step two, we, we took that, we take that same ceramic and we bond it. So this is, this is a condition two, this is condition one. So the capacitance, so which, which capacitance do you think is higher, condition one or condition two? You can write it in the, uh, in the chat. So does condition one have a higher capacitance or condition two after we bond it? So does anyone have an opinion on which, uh, which one it is? Is it one that's higher or it's two? So we have a condition one that's higher, that's true. So we have condition one that's a higher capacitance because it's in a free unconstrained state. Now, when you constrain it, you don't you do not just, just eliminate this mechanical passive because if you eliminate it, that means it can't move at all. That's not true. So when you so it is higher, but it's certainly but it is also larger than just the capacitance D. I'm just gonna call that D because that's just the dial. It's it's higher than that because there's still some mechanical part to it. So when you do apply a voltage here it's going to expand because this is elastic. You can't completely constrain it. So this is a little bit of elastic. This is an elastic material. There's no infinitely rigid material that you can use. Uh, so there's gonna, it's going to kind of constrain, it's going to kind of expand like this. So, and you know, there'll be some expansion on this side too, on the, on the elastic. So it'll kind of, it'll still get larger. It'll still change in shape, which is why after you bond a material, you, um, depending on how low the capacitance changes. So, um, if, and this is one of the practical impl implementations of how you can use capacitance. So, you know, you measure your capacitance of your crystal on the right capacitance X, and then you measure your capacitance as assembled. And you look at the change in capacitance that can be correlated to, you know, how well you bonded. All, all right, bonding condition. So generally the, the better the bond, the lower the capacitance. Um, but it won't be zero, obviously, because you're not going to, I mean, it won't completely lock out the mechanical com component, uh, but it will lower the capacitance. So whenever you do assemble, whether that's in a bolt clamped Langevin transducer, um, you, you reduce the capacitance uh, and that, uh, yeah, and, and that becomes a, a way to judge the quality of your build or, or the differences. Because uh, if you suddenly find that the change in capacitance for two different transducers that are created in the same way are different, then you, 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 you do, it, it does point toward an assembly issue. Um, so to recap, what frequency, what frequency do we use? We use a frequency. So typically, you know, you won't really go wrong with using one kilohertz. But what can happen is, um, is you do, if you might encounter some acoustic resonance. So for example, um, and this happens with devices that have sometimes like thin needles and things coming out of them. This is important for the medical transducer people that have sometimes long, um, kind of long sections, but it's also important for other transducers where you have like, I have this Langevin transducer, you can't really see it that well on my camera, but uh, there it is. But they have these electrode tabs kind of hanging out. Um, so let me just draw like a transducer. Let's say you have this stack here and you have these tabs hanging out. So these tabs also have these resonances associated with it. And they don't really show up on this. They don't show up very much on this, this uh, because they're not coupled well, but they can lead to ex additional loss values. Uh, so you also have to be sensitive. You know, if you're kind of really digging into the, the how well your capacitance values are working, um, 
you can look at the phase. Like sometimes you'll find in some transducers that you may measure ones that are more complex. So this is very simple, but transducers are more complex. They may have like random increases in phase here. So the red is phase basically. So if you have a random increase in phase, let's say this is about one kilohertz right here. Like if you have a random increase in phase there, that tells you there's some mechanical there's some mechanical action or motion happening at that frequency, which then um, uh, in, encourages you not to use that frequency, just to choose another one where there's not a kind of mechanical motion which can cause variability. Um, so, but you also want to not, I don't really recommend using one kilohertz for a few reasons. Uh, one is that it's the, the, the signal to noise ratio is lower because as, as we discussed, so if you increase frequency, you automatically increase the current. And if you increase the current, then you increase the signal that you're actually measuring from your uh, transducer device. And hence you also increase that, it's especially more important for the loss value, either, either if that you're doing phase or if you're doing uh, the dielectric loss measurement directly using an uh, LCR meter, um, that helps uh, to measure a more accurate dielectric uh, loss uh, in this case. Um, so I would say for, for, for like 40 kilohertz transducers um, and those style to use 10 kilohertz, that's, that's a general recommendation. Um, but if you want it to be more advanced in the way you look at it, I would actually take a signal generator and, um, and kind of sweep frequency just to notice if there are any weird things happening with the noise. Sometimes at certain frequencies, the transducer just makes a little more noise. That is something you want to stay away from because that will change your capacitance, but more than likely, uh, the, the effect will definitely appear in the dielectric, uh, dielectric loss, which can also, uh, you know, anomalies there can tell you about uh, the integrity of the crystal. Um, the other like important thing that you learn from um, capacitance is the is the crystal type. So if you may, if you have, let's say if you had a build, I'm I'm gonna be a little bit random right now. Hope you don't mind. But if but if you have a build, just kind of shared kind of general knowledge about capacitance. I mean, if you have specific questions, please uh please list them, and then I can make sure to get to that too. Uh, so. So let's say um, uh, crystal crystal type, uh, CRSY. Okay. Um, so if you're using more than one crystal type, so the capacitance and the dielectric loss are very much uh, related to the crystal. So if you have a transducer that you build, um, the resonant properties, as you know, are going to be affected by how long, you know, how long this front mass, you know, horn and back mass are and everything. But the crystal, but the capacitance and dielectric loss are going to be mostly determined by the crystals themselves. They also have some impact from that bolt, from the bolt's thickness and size, because the bolt size is going to uh, determine how much you're constraining uh, your transducer. So. That you can so post assembly. It's hard to it's hard to do crystal measurements. You already assembled it. You you bonded it. You you know you you screwed the your transducer together. You bolted it together. But even after that, you bolted it together. You can still do these measurements to understand the crystal properties that you used. It may be it may be used for if you did an experiment where you where you had like crystals from two suppliers, you can actually identify post assembly which supplier of crystal you use for which transducer because um, because the starting point of the capacitance will be the same reference point uh, before and after. So you can actually determine like well which which crystal went into which transducer, which is useful uh, as well. Um, so, okay, so let's let's go back to the to the list. So you can determine the crystal type. So you'll also have a low loss. So if you use a, a soft material, you'll expect uh, the dielectric loss to be um, similar, if not higher when you, after you assemble. And that's the same case for the, um, uh, for the hard piezo ceramic, you'll expect a very low loss for your dielectric uh, loss measurement, uh, unless you, you know, the crystal cracked and that's other, other ways you can investigate uh, the crystal uh, properties. Um, so calibration. Um, so whenever you measure capacitance, you have a, sometimes you have a fixture. Uh, so it's useful to do an open circuit capac open circuit calibration uh, on your fixture. Um, here I wrote 
um, the capacitance should be, we should also measure dielectric loss. This is an additional bit of information. I'll admit that it's not as often used for analysis, uh, but it's important, but, but I think still taking the measurement and having it as a reference point is important because it allows you to have another loss measurement rather than just the quality factor. When many of us may know that the quality factor has issues measuring measuring that property at residence um, uh, in certain conditions, if there's a spurious mode, if there's other problems, it can be difficult to measure. Um, so the equipment. So what I personally use to measure capacitance is an LCR meter. Um, I don't use the uh, impedance analyzer functions. Uh, one, because the imp this is a very, very, very standard device. It's not, it, there's, no, there's not too many changes or buttons, things you can change. So it's very standard, which makes it very useful because the, in, in that way. The other thing here is that you can measure very low phase angles, basically very low dielectric loss values. Whereas on an impedance analyzer, um, you you can, but it's not as, but you may uh, you may suffer in terms of uh, getting the accuracy. So I I recommend using a um, sorry my throat's getting dry. Um, uh, I recommend using an LCR meter for that measurement, and the fixturing, it's interesting uh, because. The capacitance is unique in that it doesn't, it's not, you know, your transducer is not in resonance. Uh, so uh, because it's not in resonance, it's not, you're not as sensitive to how you hold your device. So the capacitance measurements are more, uh, much more fixture independent than the resonant devices. So if you're like troubleshooting and you're trying to go back to who measured what, with what fixture and how are they holding it? And it was the crystal really clamped hard. Going back to your capacitance measurements can allow you to understand if something significantly changed from your device from one point in measurement to another one. Like I measured this device a year ago and the capacitance was let's say five nanofarads. And I measured it today is still not five nanofarads, but the you know resonance properties changed significantly. Um, that's a good indication that the measurements were done, uh, uh, that, that the fixturing is still the same. Uh, sorry, that the measurement was done correctly. I, I think I lost my train of thought there. Uh, but basically, they're fixture independent, so you're, it's harder to make it the measurement incorrectly. Therefore, it becomes a little bit more reliable uh, in that way. Um, so one thing about, and, and I'll, I'll just kind of go down here and feel free to uh, put questions in the in the chat. Uh, when you're making capacitance measurements, you should hear a noise because you're working at one kilohertz or 10 kilohertz, that frequency range. It's an audible range. Your piezo, your device should make some type of noise that you can hear. Um, and that's useful to understanding, is it like, does it work uh, in, in, in one sense? Is there mechanical motion happening? You, can, you, can, you should definitely be able to hear uh, the sound at that low frequency. I mentioned it can be used for part identification. Like what crystals you use from which manufacturer? That sometimes happens in R and D. Um, what was the ID of the crystals? Like if you have a if you have a couple of devices that you built and you don't know if you, you forgot what kind of bolts you used or you, on which certain device you can't see the interior, uh, you can't see the ID of the rings. You can use capacitance and dielectric loss for uh, for part identification. I mentioned earlier uh, for assembly quality, like how well you bonded. And I mentioned it here too, how well you, you bonded your transducer uh, can be determined by the capacitance change. Now, uh, it's, it's, there's still some subject to error here because you don't know the exact ratio for your specific transducer between the dielectric component and the mechanical component, but it's another data point uh, because resonance frequencies can get muddy uh, in terms of spurious modes and other contributing factors. Uh, so sorting crystals and transducers. <laughs> um, so one, so I'll, I'll just kind of go over like a kind of a quick story. So I had a call with a client uh, and basically uh, because I gave really good advice about, you know, using capacitance for analysis of, the, of their transducers, they actually didn't, they, they didn't decide to do many other kind of analysis steps. So I, I don't necessarily recommend that, but here's basically what happened. They, 
they got they they were buying a transducers third party, and this was a specific type of transducer which has a lot of spurious modes. And when you have a transducer which naturally has spurious modes, like for us who work on bolt clamp transducers, spurious modes are really like kind of a scary or very bad. But for some transducers, it's very normal to have those specific types of modes. So when you when you have those modes at resonance, it becomes very um, difficult to analyze the resonance impedance, the resonant frequency, anti-resonant frequencies. So I had recommended to them as a very easy direct step to understand the quality of their product or which, you know, they had a variability issue. Uh, so I recommended to sort their crystals and have like a tolerance range for capacitance. So if it's higher than this capacitance and don't use it, if it's lower than this capacitance, it's very likely the transducer doesn't work because they were, they were putting all their transducers in the application in order to determine what the performance was. So in order to really speed that process up and get rid of a lot of the faulty product, they simply measured capacitance, they understood the bond quality, the, the, the crystal quality, and then they were able to really easily, um, at least for their, you know, for their requirements and target, really speed up their process and not test so many uh, poor quality transducers. So it's a very powerful way to sort. Uh, and it's very simple. And that's the reason they were able to, they didn't have to buy expensive impedance analyzer to start measurements or measure, worry about, oh, should I use resonant frequency, anti-resonant frequency, the quality factor or the coupling factor. They just measured the impedance, a simple meter did the job for them. So it, it was kind of a big success story, but I kind of lost out on future work because it just works so well for them. Uh, so another one, like I mentioned here, in that case, when the other parameters were poor, when the resonant frequency and the anti-resonant frequency had issues, especially with spurious modes, um, capacitance can step in to help add an additional data point uh, for analysis. Um, the other point here is off-resonance transducers. Uh, the, uh, um, the capacitance there can be very... Um, uh, very well attuned to the loading condition of that capacitor. If it's an off-resonance actuator, the stiffness in the um, the stiffness and the load can be very well correlated with capacitance and, and loss values. So, in those conditions, uh, for off-resonance transducers, it becomes uh, it becomes even even more kind of important um, as well. You can also use the uh, the capacitance values for finite element model tuning. So which capacitance value do you put in your uh, piezo model? Basically, you put it through the um, uh, you put it through the uh, uh, what is it called permittivity, right? So you put it to permittivity. Uh, so it can help inform what value to use there. Uh, the most important points, I guess, to summarize here, because I want to kind of give you the summary, the summary of this. The summary of this is I would use an LCR meter. That would be one thing. To get, get, get an LCR meter, it's like $200, for example. So it's, it's not expensive to do this measurement. Um, measure capacitance on, at each stage, you know, crystal to bond uh, after bonding. Uh, start sorting your crystals to be able to see the variability because that was a huge impact I've, I've, for a few clients it's been very easy to sort crystals using capacitance by itself it's very simple and direct um and kind of keeping track of capacitance uh, a, 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 to support other conclusions you're making from mechanical uh mechanical measurements um and i think uh that that kind of covers it and yeah, I think that that's uh, uh, that that covers the the topic pretty well. And I'm going. There's there's one question here, and I'll answer that, and then I will kind of end my uh, end my recording. So, all right, there's a question, and the question is that how are these techniques applicable to transducers whose resonant frequencies are in the range of 10 megahertz? Can you still use these simple LCR meters? Um, so um, I'll I'll answer that after I stop the recording because it might take a little bit. Uh, so all right, thanks for uh, watching this video. I'll, I'll be posting it soon, and I look forward to seeing you in the next webinar. So I'm gonna stop this recording.